I was not a good kid. I got into some really bad crowds and uh, really bad, I mean, really bad dudes, really. And, uh, and I didn't make a lot of friends, and I mean, the friends I made were not good, and, and, and it was a, just a bad deal. It, everything from, uh, you know, illegal guns to, there were some pretty heavy racist things in there, and everybody's got some really crappy things in their past, and they never want to admit it. And I feel like that, if you don't really grab a hold of that piece of crap that you used to be and show it around to people, I feel like you, you're not really, you're not making the best of the transition that you made from that person. As far as the fly fishing thing, for me, it's it's being real with yourself and that I don't like a solid probably third of the people that I run into. They look at you if you roll up with neoprene duck waders and a Walmart or whatever fly rod. Half of these guys look at you and they thumb the bird at you or they, you've seen it and you BS yourself if you don't. And the point is, that turned me on because I knew I used to be that guy not necessarily fly fishing but in the same light that I would thumb the finger to the guy that didn't look the part so then when I said well where can I you know where can you go that there's nobody brook trout nobody fish a brook trout why you know, it's a 10 inch fish let's catch those I do you know I just look at brook trout and go, they're a survivor. You get a brook trout in the fall colors, man, and pearl fins, you know, red dots. I mean, you can't ask for a, a prettier picture. I'm an underdog guy too, and I think they're just an underdog fish. You stare at satellite imagery and you stare at all the maps and you're looking at corners and you're seeing gravel bars and you're seeing hooks and you're seeing tail outs and I mean you are just getting fired up. I don't even have to put the pole together. It's just when you crest wherever you're cresting or you pop out and you hear it or you see it, the water before you. I won't find another fire. My dad was a big outdoorsman. We used to have horses when we were kids, and uh, I kind of got into racing sled dogs, and I did that for a span of time. Well, running dogs, we, we were up in Alaska, and we were in the, in the interiors, in the villages. I was terribly, terribly racist. To a point, you walk around, you see these people, and in your mind, they're just worthless. To a point, they kind of look at you like, what are you doing here? You go to somebody that's, that's a bigot, and you say, what's your point of reference? I was very narrow-minded, not realizing that we live on a pimple on a log in the middle of the ocean. It was never an organized structure. It was just you were okay with hating on people because of their skin. And it's uneducated hate, you know. And then you get up, you know, you get into some place that's not, you know, the tiny little town of Duluth that you're drawing all of your freaking opinions from. 
you kind of come back and you look around where you're at and you start talking to a few people and and then you kind of realize and you go to a few places and you do a few things and then all of a sudden you realize that holy crap i'm i'm the problem peace is coming over me It's a culture that you do not realize is there. And if you don't get called on the carpet or you don't find a watershed moment in your life that makes you stop, you'll just continue. Any of those hate groups like that, their point of reference is very small. They feed on the insecurity of other people. And that's what I was. I was insecure about who I was. If you surround yourself with those people, you're never going to have the watershed moment. If I were to have never branched out, and I've said this a million times over, I'd have probably been dead by now. Like I was not leading a very productive or healthy lifestyle. So I would have probably been dead. And I'd have probably died of screaming racist. I won't find another fire I won't find another fire I won't find another fire